Welcome to the Future of Science Seminar with Marcus Monafo. Marcus is a member of the advisory board for the DSI Foundation, but he spends most of his time at the University of Bristol, where he's a professor of biological psychology focused on behavioral change. He's also an associate pro vice chancellor focused on research culture. More importantly, Marcus is one of the OGs of Open Science. He's a founding member and part of the steering group at UK Reproducibility Network, which is a grassroots movement of scientists who got together to improve the practices and outcomes of academic science in the UK. It's one of the success stories of Open Science because it's inspired a lot of other new reproducibility networks in a lot of other countries. Um, in his talk, Marcus told us how unfortunately science has become about personal brand and how scientists are only human with cognitive biases and that these biases can often lead to false findings without malicious intent. In this context, we talked about potential evidence for aliens on the moon, and I'm very curious to hear if you think that's convincing. Uh, we also talked about incentives and structures in the scientific ecosystem and how currently what's good for science is not necessarily good for scientists. And now stick around to hear what Marcus and the UK Reproducibility Network are doing to change exactly that. I've titled this Developing a Theory of Change for Academic Science. I will say from the outset that um, both myself and we as the UK Reproducibility Network uh, don't yet have a published theory of change of our, of our own. But what I'm going to be doing is providing some background as to why we need one and what I think some of the key challenges are. Uh, briefly discuss the Centre for Open Sciences um, theory of change, which I think is a really nice foundation, but then talk about how we can uh, think about implementing that and how structures like the UK Reproducibility Network and the similar reproducibility networks that are growing up in other countries can support the actual implementation of, um, of that theory of change or other theories of change. So the key challenge, as I see it, is that um, the way in which academia works has changed considerably over the years, uh, in particular over the last hundred years. But our culture, our underlying culture, still remains very much rooted in the 19th century. So you have PIs who have um, research groups and they exert a great deal of influence over how those research groups work. Those PIs often work very autonomously and universities have been described as a loose aggregation of effectively a bunch of self-employed academics who don't really feel particularly beholden to anyone else in terms of how they work. And one of the consequences of that, coupled with other unusual features of academia, such as the fact that our work is very strongly associated with our name, that in a sense is our, our brand, if you like, has led to problems such as we see in this nice cartoon from phdcomics.com, which is that things like the scientific process, which have and continue to provide us with unparalleled insights into nature, we mustn't be too nihilistic about the scale of the problem, um, but the, the scientific process has effectively become distorted by changing incentives, by the pressure to publish, by the pressure to win grants, and so on. And as a psychologist and a psychologist interested in, in behavior change, I think there are two broad mechanisms at play here that we need to bear in mind when we're thinking about how we can potentially improve the situation. One is that scientists are human, and as a result, bring a range of cognitive biases to their work in a way that they are most likely not even consciously aware of. There's this nice um, book full by randomness by Nicholas Taleb, which is all about how bad we are at understanding randomness. And there's this quote within it that I think is particularly on point when it comes to that issue of the cognitive biases that we bring to our work. Scientists may be in the business of laughing at their predecessors, but owing to an array of human mental dispositions, few realize that someone will laugh at their beliefs in the disappointingly near future. And the point here is that, you know, we go into science because we are excited about finding things, and that means that we are explicitly looking for things that then means that we can overinterpret our data um, and reach conclusions that are perhaps not fully supported because those were the conclusions that we wanted to reach. That's why we had a hypothesis in the first place. So it's easy to be led astray by our own enthusiasm. This is not necessarily malicious or even conscious. It's just that natural tendency to seek things out and therefore find what we are looking for. And this is a nice example of that that I often use in my talks. It's a geological feature on the surface of Mars, and you can see photographs taken by orbiting satellites at three different time points. And the first photograph looked like a face, and that generated a certain amount of excitement at the time, because obviously we, we haven't uh, sent any um, astronauts to Mars and even now. And 
there was a small fringe group that decided that this was evidence of intelligent extraterrestrial life. But it's certainly true, even if you don't follow through to that interpretation, that this looks like a face. But of course, in reality, that geological feature doesn't look anything like a face. The subsequent photographs made that clear. It was a trick of the light compounded by this natural tendency that we have to see faces in things, the cognitive bias known as, as pareidolia. So when we set up hypotheses and explicitly set out to find evidence for a particular hypothesis, because that's what we're excited about, perhaps that's what we've built our careers on the back of, we can see how that a similar process of, of seeing what we're looking for in our data could play out if we're not careful. And at the same time, that is occurring within incentive structures that um, are potentially not ideal, not well aligned, so that what is good for science is not necessarily the same as what could, what is good for scientists in their careers. And this survey, I think, has a uh, it captures that nicely with this quote, certain features of the working environment of science may have unexpected and potentially detrimental effect on the ethical dimensions of scientists' work. Not ethical, again, in the sense of outright fraud, but just people's behaviour being shaped in an unhelpful way by the different pressures that exist within academia to publish, to get grants, um, and to obtain evidence of prestige, if you like, in terms of which journals you publish in and where you're invited to give talks and that kind of thing. So these two factors, I think, are part of why we have some of the problems with the quality of research that have been evidenced over the last 15 years, perhaps coupled with the fact that there is an increasing tension between the underlying culture of academia, which is still very much a 19th century culture predicated on the idea of an independent scholar versus the reality of science in the 21st century, which is much more technical and involves much larger groups of collaborators, team science efforts to um, bring together evidence from a range of different uh, disciplines and perspectives. So that tension, I think, is another factor that is at play and that we need to consider. And together, those factors lead to um, situations whereby <clears throat> problematic behaviours that are shown here in this nice cartoon by the blogger Neurosceptic not only occur, but become so embedded that they almost become normative. So, for example, we often <clears throat> are told that we need to explore our data. And of course, there's nothing wrong with exploring data. But if we then tell a story post hoc about what we found and make it sound like, <coughs> excuse me, what we found was looking for in the first place, then that has a distorting effect and means that the robustness of the evidence that we publish is much less than it should be. So we, again, perhaps because we are incentivized to, to um, provide very compelling evidence, <coughs> end up in a situation where good advice, which is that we need to explore our data, becomes distorted by those incentives to then end up with a very clean looking narrative in what we eventually publish. So as I mentioned, the evidence has emerged over perhaps the last 15 years that this is really causing problems in terms of the robustness of the evidence that's generated and the ability of that evidence to translate into real world impact. I think it's notable that some of the first um, voices expressing concern about the quality of academic science came from the pharmaceutical industry where the incentives although it's not that the pharmaceutical industry is without problematic incentives, but certainly at the drug development stage, there are strong incentives to get the right answer in that if you make an incorrect go-no-go -no -go decision on a novel compound that could be a potential future therapeutic, if you make a correct, um, an incorrect no-go decision, you might be costing your company a lot of money. Whereas if you make an incorrect um, uh, go decision, you are also costing your company a lot of money, albeit in slightly different ways. Money that is spent on R&D that is not returned because the drug eventually doesn't work or by blocking what could have been a potentially um, valuable therapeutic compound. So I think it's interesting that the pharmaceutical industry, which has a very strong vested interest in correctly identifying uh, novel compounds that are likely to work, was one of the first to raise concerns about the quality of academic research. But since then, there have been empirical efforts across a range of different disciplines, psychological science, cancer biology, experimental economics, and others, all broadly converging on the same conclusion, which is that about 40% of published research is actually robust and reproducible. It's an open question what that proportion should be, but I think there is growing consensus that the situation could be improved. <clears throat> 
So one of the arguments that we made um, in this paper in 2014, following a meeting that was convened by um, the CHDI Foundation, which is a funder that uh, supports Huntington's research in the US, is that part of the issue is that on top of those factors that are at play that I mentioned earlier in terms of cognitive biases, um, incentive structures, and the tension between our underlying culture and our modern ways of working, is that when we evaluate the quality of papers, we very much do so by focusing on the final product rather than the process that gave rise to them. And the analogy that was drawn by Roby Blumenstein, who's the CEO of the CHDI Foundation, is that that's a bit like the US automobile industry in the 1970s, where quality control happened at the end of the production process. Someone would count the number of wheels on the car, for example, and check that the engine started. And the statistician, Edwards Deming, took the concept of quality control throughout the process to the Japanese automobile industry, transformed the quality of um, the outputs of that industry, if you like, and the Japanese automobile industry still has a reputation for reliability today, to the extent that now all manufacturing processes adopt that same process of effectively checking products as they work through the production process so that you build a small part, check that it works, put it into a larger part, check that that works and so on. And by the end of the uh, pipeline, you have a well-built car that is much more reliable. But the less intuitive insight that Demings had was that by focusing on quality throughout the process, not only do you improve the quality of the eventual product, which is intuitive, but you also improve productivity because you're not investing resources in fixing cars that break down later. And that's less intuitive, I think. The analogy with science is that if we focus on evaluating the end product of our process, the scientific paper, for example, and focus less on quality control throughout the process, then not only will we be producing less reliable outputs, but we will also be slowing the rate at which we generate knowledge that can transfer into societal benefit, human benefit, health benefit, and so on. Because we'll be creating blind alleys that we go down, we will be investing um, resource into findings that turn out not to be robust further down the line. So it's not that science won't ultimately self-correct, self it's that it will do so inefficiently, more slowly than it otherwise might, if we could focus more on quality in particular during the process. So we then unpacked what that meant in terms of where the different points of failure were in how we currently do research, and <clears throat> in particular, who the stakeholders were that could help us to improve matters in those different areas. So if we look at this, um, classical hypothetical deductive cycle shown on the left. There are different steps to the process of generating knowledge, generating hypotheses, designing studies, collecting data, and so on, and a range of different threats to the integrity of each of those different steps in the process. And then we identified a range of potential solutions. And I say potential because all of these will need to be evidenced. It's not something that we can take um, for granted that will necessarily work, but they at least have the potential to improve the situation. These range of different proposals to protect against cognitive biases, to improve um, methodological training and so on. And in particular, who the stakeholders were that had the ability to exert influence over each of those different steps in the process, who had the ability to actually implement some of these proposals. And those stakeholders included journals, funders, institutions, and also researchers themselves. But it's worth noting that researchers themselves have relatively limited scope to um, bring about change in terms of these proposals we identified here. The one area where we felt that researchers could uh, do a great deal themselves was by adopting open research practices, with open research practices providing transparency and scope for scrutiny that should, in principle, serve to drive up quality. But many of the other proposals fell uh, in the domain of stakeholders such as publish publishers, uh, journals, funders, institutions, and so on. So in other words, if we're going to bring about change, we need to be coordinating the efforts of these different stakeholders in the research ecosystem, focusing on one, any, one element alone will be insufficient, not least because in a highly interconnected system such as academic science, Focusing on one area alone will probably lead to even less change than we might hope for because there will be compensatory 
activity in other areas of the system that will act against that change if we don't take a, a holistic and joined up perspective. And it's also worth noting that in many countries, including the UK, these concerns have reached uh, a very high level. So in the UK, for example, um, the Science and Technology Committee, which is part of our, um, part of our parliament, uh, launched an inquiry last year into reproducibility and research integrity and, and um, solicited uh, written and oral evidence from across the sector. It's yet to report. It'll be interesting to see what the outcomes of that inquiry are. But the mere fact that that inquiry was launched suggests that policymakers, parliamentarians are aware of these concerns. And if we're not careful as a sector ourselves, we run the risk of being regulated by politicians in a way that... Um, is not necessarily ideal because although these politicians are certainly very engaged with these concerns, the risk is that they will come up with a bureaucratic solution that is not well suited to what we want to retain in academia, which is the intellectual freedom and the ability to um, do blue sky research as well as, uh, for example, um, research that's of direct benefit to society. So in other words, I think the onus is on us to get our house in order effectively Otherwise, we run the risk of um, very direct regulation, and that may not be the best outcome. So that was part of the motivation for establishing the UK Reproducibility Network. This was launched in 2019 on the back of several years of lobbying funders for support to provide a modest resource to allow us to um, appoint an administrator and set up a website effectively. But the network was established to bring together explicitly those different elements of the research ecosystem that we mentioned in our Manifesto for Reproducible Science. In other words, researchers themselves, institutions, and then those other sectoral organizations, funders, publishers, learned societies, and so on, that are also part of the mix. So the key features of UKRN is that it's very much a peer-led consortium. So we comprise three main parts. We have local networks that are local self-organizing groups of researchers at um, different institutions that come together to run journal clubs and seminar series and uh, set up open research working groups and so on. And we have those at uh, just over 60 institutions across the UK at the moment, which are the small circles shown here, although this figure is slightly out of date because the number is growing all the time. Then we have institutional members and institutions can join by appointing a senior academic whose role is focused on research improvement that sits at the senior management level. And we have those at just over 30 institutions across the UK at the moment. And the idea is that in an ideal world, every institution would have both a local network lead and an institutional lead working in partnership, the local network lead representing the voice of the grassroots research community, the institutional lead working more at the senior management level, um, focusing on hiring and promotion criteria and other um, trading provision and so on, with those two working in partnership, advocating for each other, challenging each other and so on. And then we have a group of um, what we call external stakeholders, who are the funders, the publishers, the learned societies and so on. And that structure allows us to coordinate activity and collaborate both within those different elements. So local network leads coming together to form a community of practice, for example, but also across those different elements. So, for example, when um, UK Research and Innovation, which is our major public funder in the UK, was setting up the Committee on Research Integrity that was launched last year, we were able to put a number of our local network leads directly in touch with them so that they could give their perspective as to what they felt as researchers was required from that committee. Um, and that ability to create those direct contact between different elements of the research system I think is um, part of what makes our structure quite effective. So we work collaboratively. The um, guiding principle is that we want to connect, coordinate and collaborate across those different elements. And at the moment, our major focus is on open research, not just within scientific disciplines, but more broadly. But the focus of this talk today is very much on, on scientific disciplines. And it's worth noting that that uh, structure has led to the formation of similarly structured reproducibility networks in other countries. And actually, again, this figure is out of date now because we have reproducibility networks in Belgium, in uh, Norway and in other countries and several others are in the process of being set up. But this also then provides for um, 
coordination at a supranational level so that we now have representatives of these national reproducibility networks coming together on a regular basis to meet, discuss their national level activity and think about ways in which we can coordinate and collaborate between countries, particularly within Europe, but not, not solely. Um, and that's a very exciting development that, again, I think speaks to the potential power of this collaborative approach that we have tried to um, try to champion. So how can we then overlay the structures that exist within these national reproducibility networks onto things like the Centre for Open Science Theory of Change? So if you've seen this, it's a very elegant description of the process that the Centre of uh, Center for Open Science is trying to drive by, as you can see on this figure, making it possible, making it easy, making it normative, making it rewarding and making it required. Working through these different levels by providing infrastructure, making sure that that infrastructure has um, a good user experience effectively is easy to use. Then building uh, communities of practice around that and, and generating the grassroots interest in uh, that infrastructure so that it's actually used and becomes expected. Then working with institutions and funders, for example, to make it um, directly rewarded so that these things are reflected in hiring and pro uh, promotion practices and then making it required by mandating, for example, data sharing, as many funders are now doing. But the challenge with this, of course, is that, as I mentioned earlier, you have a highly interconnected system and it's not always easy to focus on one single element of that. And it's also important to make sure that the voice of researchers themselves is part of that movement towards a new way of working. And one of the challenges is that the people who are typically engaged as, if you like, early adopters with these kinds of um, ways of working are the ones who are effectively already converted. And what we need to do is make sure that we are also hearing from those who would not necessarily uh, elect into these new ways of working so that we can understand what the barriers are, we can understand what else needs to be brought into the mix to enable those people to adopt those, um, those ways of working. And that's where I think the, the structures that are provided by the different national reproducibility networks can help because it provides access to those different elements of the research ecosystem, researchers themselves, institutions, journals, funders, and so on. So um, what I want to talk about then is very briefly how we are doing that within the UK Reproducibility Network and a couple of the initiatives in particular that we're supporting that are not our own projects, but are projects that we are um, working collaboratively with because we feel that they are in keeping with what we're trying to achieve. So as I mentioned, we have these three different elements to our network, local networks, institutional members and external stakeholders. But we also have a number of initiatives that are separate to us, have been launched by others, but which we support directly because we feel that, um, that they are valuable initiatives that will support the activity that we're trying to drive forward. And it's worth saying that we were lucky enough to receive um, substantial funding from uh, one of the UK funders, Research England, to drive the uptake of open research practices. <clears throat> and that's why over the next four years, our primary focus is on, on open research. So what we're doing, and, and to to understand this, you need to be thinking of both the Centre for Open Science Theory for Change that I mentioned, but also the structure that UKRN brings to that. In the context of open research, first of all, you need to have good infrastructure to be able to support open research practices, to be able to deposit data, code, other materials. It's worth noting that there are many repositories out there, but curated repositories, in other words, repositories that have teams behind them that check deposits before they're published to ensure that the quality of the deposit, the metadata, the data dictionary is sufficient. Those, I think, um, are more valuable because even researchers who have experience of data sharing often miss things out when they uh, come to deposit their data or um, include potentially um, sensitive data within their deposit or data that could lead to re-identification, for example. So data teams often embedded in library services teams within universities, I think can amplify the value of the digital infrastructure that is increasingly available. So you need to have the infrastructure and ideally that infrastructure needs to be 
supported by, um, for example, people in library services. But we also need to provide training. So researchers need to understand how to engage in these open research practices. And that requires training that is scalable and interoperable. One of the challenges is that if training is delivered separately across different institutions, the way in which people are trained to work will be slightly different. And that will lead to friction when people move from one institution to another. So at UKRN, we've been developing a series of resources around open research, beginning with these open research primers that are available on our website that provide a very basic introduction to concepts like the use of preprints or data sharing. But we're also developing a range of train the trainer courses, which mean that each one of our member institutions, the 30 plus uh, universities across the UK that are part of UKRN currently and, and more are joining all the time, will be able to send representatives to um, develop training courses structured around these online resources that they can then deliver back to their host institution in a way that's tailored to the specific local context, but which shares some common features with the other training that's being delivered across all of the other institutions so that the, um, the training that is delivered is interoperable and researchers therefore can move freely between those institutions with less friction than if they'd been trained in um, in ways that were more uniquely specific to the host institution. Then we also need to be incentivizing the uptake of open research practices, again, going back to the Center for Open Science model. Um, and we need to recognize that changing how we work is effortful. So we need to incentivize that, uh, that effort to make sure that people actually take up these working practices, attend the training, but then also start to implement what they learn on that training. And so again, what we have done as UKRN is try to coordinate and harmonize those incentives. So for example, part of our open research program includes looking at hiring and promotion criteria across all of our different member institutions and ensuring that as much as possible, the incentivization of open research practices, for example, by recognizing them in promotion criteria is consistently implemented across our different partner institutions. We also have things like open research awards prizes that are run every year to um, promote and champion and highlight examples of good open research practices. And some of those are now being set up in regional clusters so that multiple institutions come together to offer, um, offer these awards and again, foster sharing of good practice across those different institutions. So again, that coordination that these structures can provide can help to amplify um, this, um, this change that we're trying to bring about and accelerate it. So one of the guiding principles of this activity is that we want to make sure that what we do is interoperable. The train the trainer courses are one example of that. So providing training that allows for a degree of consistency um, is, is part of the equation. But we also need to make sure that the incentives offered across institutions are aligned. So as well as those resources for researchers themselves, the open research primers, we're developing resources for institutions that will allow for common approaches to, for example, transparency in a research across those different partner institutions. And of course, these resources are all available, um, uh, freely available on our website. So you don't have to be part of UKRN formally to make use of these resources. But with the structure that we have, we can promote their uptake within our partner institutions, all the time with this activity being informed by grassroots researchers themselves, with their voice being um, delivered through the local networks and, and those communities of practice on the ground being part of how we develop this activity. So that's one example. Something else that I want to talk about is how we've been um, working with our stakeholder groups, the publishers, the funders and so on, to again promote specific initiatives. So one of the initiatives that we support is the registered reports funding uh, publishing model. You may be familiar with this. The basic idea behind a registered report is that you submit um, your study protocol effectively to a journal before any data collection happens. And the journal evaluates the study protocol on the basis of, is the research question important and is the methodology robust? So that the findings of the study will therefore be of value, of interest, irrespective of what those findings actually are. And this is meant to protect against things like publication bias and um, excessive interrogation of your data just to identify a statistically significant finding, for example. So that publishing format is now available at several hundred journals. The growth in that um, 
format, which was conceived by Chris Chambers um, back in 2013, almost 10 years ago, has been really dramatic. But of course, merely offering a, a publishing format is only part of the solution because we need to incentivize people to take up that new way of working. And as I said before, there's always a degree of effort involved in that. But of course, the idea that we should evaluate a study on the basis of is the question important and is the methodology robust? That's very similar to what funders do. So there is a great deal of overlap between what is being delivered by a journal when it reviews a stage one registered report, that initial protocol submission, and what is being done by a funding agency when they review a grant application. So there is a certain logic to combining those two different review processes into a single harmonized review process. And so this is what we've been doing with registered reports funding partnerships. And in particular, uh, we've been working with a major funder in the UK, Cancer Research UK, which is one of our largest uh, medical charities that funds cancer research. And currently we're working with a consortium of 12 journals across three different publishers, the publishers being Wiley, Springer Nature and PLOS. And the journals include Nature Communications and PLOS Medicine. So certainly high profile journals that most researchers would be quite happy to publish their work in. And the idea is that we are bringing together those two different review processes in a way that keeps the review processes distinct. The funder does the funder review, the journal does the journal review, but we effectively run it like a relay race of those grant applications that are successful, that are offered funding. They are given the opportunity to move straight to a stage one submission with a journal. The journal then picks up the process and runs its own review process, but with the option to bring in the reviewers of the grant so that they can also then review the stage one submission. And the idea there is that that is efficient because these people have already seen the grant application, which is going to be very similar to the stage one um, protocol submission to the journal. And it gives them the opportunity to make critical comments that they may not have wanted to make during the review stage, the grant review stage, because they didn't want the study to not be funded but which could still serve to improve the quality of the eventual study because all of this review is happening before any data collection begins. There are a few different models of registered reports funding partnership that have been piloted. So one um, is this example, which um, is between the Children's Tumor Foundation and PLOS One, um, where in this case, the, um, the review process is very much handled by um, the funder and in principle acceptance is offered by the journal when the grant is awarded. So in other words, the process is handed over to the funder. Um, and um, then there are others where the process is much more um, handled by the journal. So this is another example of a pilot between the CHDI Foundation and PLOS Biology. But in those two cases, if you're either asking the funder to take responsibility for the review process or the journal to take responsibility for the review process, you're then asking the other partner to effectively um, let go of their control over their review process. And so we think that the partnership between Cancer Research UK and now a range of journals, but the initial pilot was with, was with one journal, Nicotine Tobacco Research, where effectively the two processes remain um, separate and they're simply coordinated rather than directly combined, is easier for journals and funders to adopt because they can retain their existing processes and simply have to focus on how they coordinate the handover from one stage to the next. But the fact that we have a major funder who is behind this initiative and a range of major publishers and major journals that are behind this initiative, I think speaks to the appetite on the part of those other elements of the research system, the funders and the publishers and so on to innovate and to look at ways in which the quality of the work that we produce can be improved through these kinds of revisions effectively to our processes that better incentivize ways of working that we think will improve the quality of our eventual results. In this case, the, um, the uptake of registered reports, which now there is good evidence do in fact improve the quality of published research but which need to be incentivized. Otherwise, they'll only be taken up by a subset of researchers who are particularly motivated to work in that way. And what we want to do is make this a normative part of 
um, how we all work as academic researchers. Another initiative that we're supporting, um, which is actually very similar to what DSI is trying to do, is looking at um, how we can move away from the journal as the primary version of record. So at the moment, journals and the concept of the journal is, is 400 years old, are trying to do two things at once, disseminating findings to researchers, practitioners, and so on, but also being the version of record. But the problem is that research increasingly is much more dynamic than a single journal article is able to capture and has many elements to it, particularly as we move towards more complex research that brings together different methodologies, different disciplines. So again, the idea that you can adequately capture that in three, four, 5,000 words, albeit potentially with some supplementary material, I think is increasingly showing its limits, if you like. So Octopus is one example of the innovations in this space that provides a platform that allows those different elements of the research process, the problem, the hypothesis, the study protocol, the data, the code to analyze those data and so on, all to be um, deposited independently on this platform and linked together in ways that don't require all of those different elements to, came, to come from the same, same researcher or same research group. In other words, different researchers, different research groups could deposit data that speak to a particular problem or hypothesis, deposit their different study protocols, so that what you create is a much richer set of uh, elements that serve to give um, to advance knowledge through the gradual iterative um, accretion of evidence around particular problems and hypotheses. And that better reflects the dynamic nature of research in the 21st century, rather than the more static version that is currently reflected in journal articles. <clears throat> so what we need to be doing, I think, is moving from this version of record model where a single static snapshot is laid down in the in the academic archaeological record, if you like, to more of a record of versions that allows for that dynamic updating of knowledge that is a better reflection of how science actually works in practice now, given the number of research groups that are um, studying similar problems and the speed at which data can be generated and new problems identified. We also, I think, need to distinguish between the different functions that are currently all delivered in, in large part through journals. So archiving, this is the record of versions problem and their platforms like Octopus provide the potential for a much more agile and dynamic system. But then also the quality control function, which at the moment is delivered via a journal peer review, but where there is now increasing scope for both pre and post publication peer review and where that quality control happens. So again, registered reports provides that peer review before any data collection has begun which we think improves quality, not least because problems can be identified before the study has started. And at the moment, post-publication peer review, uh, sorry, post-study peer review means that only sticking plasters can be applied to something that has already been completed. Then there's the searchability and findability function, which again, uh, doesn't necessarily need to be located within journals. And the, the exegesis, the summary function which many authors provide themselves, but which some, uh, some journals like Nature provide uh, in, in their front matter by summarizing what has been published elsewhere. So these different functions are currently largely located within journals, but there's no particular reason why they need to be. We need to be thinking more creatively about who is best placed to deliver each function and whether or not we need journals or at least need journals in the form that has existed for the last 400 years. So can we disaggregate these different functions, still pot potentially retaining a role for journals, particularly around the searchability and the, uh, and the exegesis functions, but think about other platforms that could support the archiving and different mechanisms that could support the quality control function. So that's a very quick summary of how I think we need to be addressing some of these concerns that have been raised over the last 15 years tackling some of the mechanisms that give rise to those concerns, the cognitive biases, the incentive structures, and our underlying research culture. But how we need to have not only a coherent theory of change to allow us to do that, 
but the structures in place to bring together the different elements of the research uh, ecosystem so that we can coordinate our activity, make sure that the solutions that we are um, implementing and evidencing and testing are informed by the voice of the grassroots research community itself, but also make sure that those other stakeholders, the institutions, the funders, the publishers, the learned societies and so on, are also being brought into the mix and that that coordination is happening not only at a national level, but at a supranational level. Thank you. Wonderful. Marcus, thanks so much. This is this is super exciting. I uh, uh, I felt my heartbeat go up at various points in in your presentation. In full agreement with what you're saying. This is uh, this is great. Also, at this point, an encouragement to our audience: please drop your questions in the in the chat or just speak up directly. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that that uh, Carla and me we we have plenty of questions that we can bombard Marcus with, but we also want to hear from you. Um, maybe I'm just going to kick off the discussion uh, by by asking you just out of curiosity. So, how did this amazing initiative actually get started? So, who was who was like you know who was driving it at the beginning? What was the context? Uh, how did this thing grow? How did you go about this? Uh, as in the UK Reproducibility Network? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, it emerged semi organically in that, like I say, the, these conversations have been happening at least since 2005, when Johnny Amidas published his paper on why most published research findings are false. Like I say, it's worth remembering, this isn't a new conversation. You know, Charles Babbage wrote about the decline of science in England in 1833, I think. So every so often people say, you know what, we could do better. And I think that's a good thing. That's healthy. Um, because we should always be thinking, how could we do better, particularly when we're funded by public money and so on. But there were many of us in the UK and internationally who were thinking about these things, who were um, talking about how we could do things better, promoting open science, uh, promoting pre-registration and registered reports and so on. The funders became aware of this concern quite early on. And um, in, I think, 2015, the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK, together with uh, the Wellcome Trust, which is a major charitable funder, and a few of our public funders like the Medical Research Council and, and others, came together to hold a meeting on reproducibility and what could be done about it that was held at the Wellcome Trust. And several of us were at that meeting. And through the conversations that we had effectively over coffee and in between the talks, we realized that there were several of us who were really engaged in this, these issues on the researcher side, the academic side, that there was clearly an appetite on the funder side for something to be done. But there was a certain reluctance on the funder side for any one funder to say, well, we will do something about this because that would imply that it was their problem and you know, why should they be the only ones doing something about it? So we then started lobbying the funders and we said, look, we, we will take this on. We, as academics, will, will um, coordinate what's already happening and set up new activities, but you need to give us a bit of support. And it took us a while, but in 2018, we managed to get most of the major funders in the UK and some publishers and other learned societies um, and other organizations together in a room in Bristol. And we basically locked the doors and said we wouldn't let them out until they gave us some money. And um, <laughs> and then they did. They agreed to that? Well, I mean, it wasn't quite that bad. But the point was there was a lot of, there was a lot of interest on the part of the funders and the publishers to do something. Right. And what we said was, look, if each of you gives us a very small amount of money, I mean, we were asking for sort of five or 10,000 pounds a year which in the context of a big funder is not much money. And we said, if you each give us that, 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 that's enough. We can then appoint an administrator, set up a website and start to bring together all of this grassroots enthusiasm, mm -hmm. all of this energy, all of these ideas and start to move things forward. So that was our strategy. Ask for small amounts of money from multiple funders, pool that so that we have enough to get the thing off the ground. We were able to launch in March, 2019. And then our... Um, medium term strategy was in the first three years to secure more substantial programmatic funding, which is that large award that I talked about in my talk. But it was really just bringing together people who are already doing this stuff. And again, just coordinating and collaborating. So it was people like Chris Chambers, who launched Registered Reports, Dorothy Bishop, who'd been blogging about this stuff for a long time, Malcolm McLeod at Edinburgh, who'd been um, pioneering um, the use of meta research, meta analysis in rodent models, in rodent studies, that those kinds of people were already pushing for change, but by coming together, we were able to have a louder voice and we were able to get this initiative off the ground. 
That's amazing. And how many people and how many institutions are currently involved in, in your network? Well, people is harder to say because we don't, um, we're not a member organization, but we have right. these 60 local networks. Um, so local networks of researchers that will range from, I don't know, 20 or 30 people to a couple of hundred, depending on, on how mature that local network is. But we have those at 60 plus institutions across the UK, then institutional members that have this senior um, academic that sits alongside senior management focusing on, on what we do. We have those at um, uh, just over 30 institutions. Um, the stakeholder group is something like 40 organizations now. So like I say, publishers, funders, and so on. Um, and I think we have 15 national reproducibility networks now. That's amazing. And you also showed that this is already uh, growing beyond the UK, right? So yeah. you're, the, the, this is already inspiring uh, similar initiatives in, in other countries. Um, I'm, I'm also just curious about how did that come about? That they, uh, was this like also driven by, by local researchers who were sort of got inspired by you and then just started doing something similar? Or how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the like all societal change, a large part of it has to be driven by people on the ground, if you like. Um, right. But it's made easier if there are key people in senior positions who support that. Yeah. So, for example, yeah. one of the first national reproducibility networks that was set up was set up in Switzerland. And that was partly because there was interest at the grassroots in, in you know, people noticed what we were doing in the UK and thought that actually that that same structure in general terms could be applied in different countries. Uh -huh. But in uh -huh. Switzerland, the um, Swiss National Science Foundation, and in particular, Matthias Egger, were very quick to get behind that initiative and provide support for it. So that made it easier, I think. But it varies. Right. You know, some countries start as a grassroots movement and grow up. Others start more top down with with funders saying, you know, this is something we'd like to see. Right. Um, so it, it varies. But that's the point about our approach, which is that we want a model that is allows us to do that coordination and that collaboration function that I talked about, but is sufficiently flexible to allow for the implementation to be tailored to the local context, whether that's a, lo that, whether that's a single institution, because, right. you know, we have institutions ranging from Oxford through to the University of Wolverhampton, through to the Royal Veterinary College, very different institutions. So we can't have a one size fits all approach. Similarly, the UK is different to Switzerland, is different to Germany, is different to Sweden. Right. So they need to have their own twist, if you like, on the basic idea. Right, exactly. And one thing that uh, that I found noticeable is that some of the really, really big players in terms of countries that contribute to a, a global scientific output, they were still missing from that, right? So there is, uh, uh, at least on, on the map that you showed, the US wasn't part of it, Canada wasn't part of it, China wasn't part of it, Japan wasn't part of it. Uh, so what's going on there? Yeah, so Canada now does have a national reproducibility network. It's only just launched. Um, so that's that's the map being out of date. The US um, always likes to be first. And if they're not first, then they'll come up with the same idea, but call it something different. Um, <laughs> okay. So they have Helios, which is very much focused on open science. And effectively, although it really only includes the institutional layer of our structure, it doesn't have the grassroots element. In many ways, it's very similar to what we're trying to achieve. So um, we have invited Helios to, to be part of our um, meeting of National Reproducibility Network leads because, in effect, Helios is a, is a U.S. reproducibility network or at least shares sufficient similarity for, um, for it to still be useful for them to be part of that coordinating conversation. So um, Greg Tannenbaum is, is the person that, that represents Helios at our meetings. Um, you're right that obviously China is a very big and growing part of the research ecosystem uh, globally but of course it's it's very different in lots of different ways and i think it's um that that we might need to uh, think carefully about how to um to bring them on board because there are all sorts of challenges i think when it comes to working with them um, with china and chinese researchers and they themselves experience all sorts of challenges in terms of the incentives to publish and publish in certain kinds of journals and so on. So I think they're at a sort of different stage of the journey, if you like, and all countries are at different stages. You know, the Netherlands is very far ahead when it comes to things like open research practices um, compared to many other countries in Europe. So one of the nice things about coming together, is, as well as that coordination part that I talked about, is that we can learn from each other, learn what works, what doesn't work, um, share evidence as to whether or not things work as intended or have unintended consequences. So um, 
you know, if I, if I step back a bit, I think academia has become very individualistic and competitive over the years. And actually, there, is, there are plenty of places where we can work, work more collaboratively, where it benefits everybody. You know, we don't have to be competitive the whole time. Yeah, completely agree. So there, uh, one thing that I uh, that I uh, learned recently is that at Dutch universities, basically all of them, they have now hired and uh, uh, basically installed an, an open science officer. So somebody who is specifically responsible for these sorts of things. And uh, are you already uh, uh, like talking to these people? Is there already some sort of collaboration or like coordination going on? Yeah, well, I, I mean, one of the ironies is that because um, the Netherlands was so far ahead when it came to things like open research, it was less obvious why they needed a national reproducibility network. Um, but that conversation is now um, developing and so people like Lex Bouter and so on are, are sort of strong advocates for what we're doing. And um, uh, and hopefully that will be another national reproducibility network that will come on board soon. Because um, even if all of these things are already happening, I think there is still value in that kind of joining up across the different levels, the researchers, the institutions, the um, the funders and publishers and so on and then supranationally across different countries. Very cool. Yeah, one question we got from the audience. <clears throat> so Gina had a question, and thank you, Gina, for that question. It's a good one. Um, so she says, I like the integration of funding and publication and see how that can create an infrastructure for change. However, in some countries, for example, New Zealand, she says, a very small proportion of research ex is externally funded and much research is done by those 19th century scientists um, who are independent with small budgets. So where does this system that you suggested for pro publishing and funding, uh, where does that leave, the, leave those scientists? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think the starting point is something that I've touched on already, which is that there's not going to be a sort of single solution and there's not going to be a one size fits all solution. So the registered reports funding partnerships are great for those people who receive um, grant funding. In any country, there'll be plenty of people who don't receive grant funding. Um, that's true in the UK as well. And it will be more true in some disciplines than others. And it will be different across institutions. Some institutions are more research intensive than others, or at least have received more external funding than others. And it'll be different across countries in the way that, that Gina describes. So that's part of the mix, but it's not the only one. If you think about some of the guiding principles of what we're trying to do, we're trying to encourage people to work more collaboratively. We're trying to encourage people to do research that um, will provide genuinely informative answers to important questions. Um, and sometimes what you need to get a really informative answer, a really definitive answer is larger sample size, for example. And one of the ways in which you can do that in the context that, that um, Gina's talking about is to create collaborations across researchers. So that requires a slightly different cultural change, which encourages people to work with others rather than just by themselves. But um, structures like the Psychological Science Accelerator are an example of um, effectively digital infrastructure that's being set up to support that, to bring together researchers so that they can all collaborate on common projects, collect data within their own institution, within their own department on the sort of scale that they are able to, but then to pool those data with others to make sure that the eventual result is, is one that is, um, if not definitive, at least highly precise and likely to um, give a useful answer to that question. And there are other ways of doing that. One of the things that um, a colleague of mine in the UK, Kate Button, has done is work with the British Psychological Society to promote collaborative student projects across institutions, because students similarly typically only have the resources to collect a modest amount of data. But if they can do that collaboratively with other students across different institutions, then they not only produce more definitive results, but they also learn transferable skills like collaboration. It helps with um, things like developing study protocols that then make it easy to pre-register your study. So there, there are a range of different initiatives that we're supporting, a range of different potential solutions that are out there. And we'll have to see which ones work, which ones improve things in the way that we would hope, which ones people actually use, because you can have the best system in the world, but if no one uses it, it's not going to make anything better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds really cool. We have one more question that came in and it's uh, related, I think, to what you were mentioning just in the end with the students collaborating across institutions. So Raluca asks, um, I might have missed it, but are there examples of uh, efforts to make research more institution agnostic? Like, is there similar things for established scientists or is this more just happening for students? How does that look like? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot is happening for students, in particular PhD students and early career researchers. But I think that's because those people are the ones who are most engaged with this stuff. They're the ones that come into academia and go, well, this is all a bit weird because, you know, this is not how you would invent a system if you were starting from scratch now. Whereas people like me who've been in the system for, you know, 20 years um, have just kind of grown up with it and don't don't really necessarily see it for as weird as it is. So those early career researchers, I think, are already very engaged. So one of the challenges is how do we get those more established researchers engaged with these things as well. But in terms of making things institution agnostic, I think the kinds of things I've talked about, the Psychological Science Accelerator, Collaborative Student Project, they're an example of that. And we can also learn from other fields that have already been on this journey, if you like. So as Philip will know, um, genomics, and in particular genome-wide association studies, realized, what, 15, 20 years ago, that they could only really work if people collaborated, because the sample sizes you need are so vast that certainly at the time they couldn't be achieved by any single research group so people had to work collaboratively that meant that they had to write study protocols and code that could be implemented across different um, studies different study cohorts which then facilitated sharing of data and code facilitated pre-registration of study protocols so there was a kind of virtuous cycle that flowed from the mere act of collaboration and people began collaborating because they realized that they just couldn't generate useful knowledge if they didn't. So we can learn from those case studies, if you like, of disciplines that have already moved along this journey and think, well, how can we apply elements of that in different contexts? What could remain the same? What would need to be tweaked and so on? Uh, maybe a last question from uh, from me, just out of pr uh, personal interest. So you talked about that uh, the UK Reproducibility Network is also providing training. So I'm wondering, so what type of training are you providing and to who and, and who is actually uh, doing that, who is doing the work and how scalable are these efforts? Well, we have different types of training. So we, we have our own seminar series. So if you're interested in that, you can go on our website and see see what we're offering there. So, you know, feel free. It's ukrn.org. Um, we also run um, activity for our local network leads because we want to create a community of practice at the grassroots where these people who are leading local efforts feel like they're part of a sort of bigger community. So we bring them together for a residential retreat once a year. Um, but in terms of the open research training, that's being delivered as train the trainer courses, where the idea is that you bring in people who already know about data sharing, code sharing and so on. And they focus on the pedagogy of developing a workshop that they will then take back to their home institution and deliver locally. And that workshop can be tailored to, you know, for example, the Royal Veterinary College might need a different um, workshop on data sharing than the University of Wolverhampton because they're very different institutions. But because the trainers will have all come together and shared their experiences and ideas and, and their content, all of the different workshops will share some common DNA effectively and be as interoperable as possible without being completely homogenized, because again, there needs to be that flexibility to deliver what is needed on the ground, if you like. And that's the bit that makes it scalable. So our hope is that we will be able to train a certain number of trainers every year, and they will be able to deliver a certain number of workshops every year, so that the number of researchers that we reach will will grow very rapidly. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm, uh... I'm, I'm really flabbergasted and blown away by this wonderful initiative. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus, for, for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us today, to share all these insights with us. Um, absolutely amazing. And it's a pleasure. Really well, thank it. you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, Happy New Year to everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs>